Well, now here's the final programme in the present series that's been introducing us to the delights of the home computer. With trophies and a big prize competition, it's Chip In. Hello and welcome to the last programme in our current series of Chip In, where we delve into the world of the home computer. Today, astrologer Russell Grant will be finding out whether the computer can replace his mystical charts and years of experience as an astrologer. And if you're a gambling man, or a gambling woman for that matter, we've also discovered somebody who does the pools and bets on the horses using a computer. And following suit, Jane Bird, who's the editor of Personal Computer World and the resident Chip In expert, will be making some predictions about the future of the home micro. <laughs> But now, chip in challenge, and our last chance to play the chip in game based on Xenon Ray. Today, we have the Brigden family from Rochdale competing against the Hodson family from Sale. So, Petra Brigden and Alan Hodson, it's your awesome task to save me and Liverpool from destruction at the hands of the alien liverbirds. Fingers on joysticks and buttons, you've both got one minute from. Now! So, here's Petra, giving those liverbirds some stick. Meanwhile, looking over Alan's shoulder, waggling that joystick furiously. So at the top of the screen, you can see his score. Down at the bottom, his fuel rapidly running out. Also on the Mersey there, you can see waves. I think they've been made by Liverpool's new city council. Cyril Smith's personal launch sinking on the left. Petro Brignan firing rather indiscriminately. Using up that fuel rather rapidly. For goodness sake, hit something, Liverpool's fate is in your hands. Meanwhile, Alan, the Granada Logo man moving about furiously, being zapped there by one of the Liver Birds, that's rather unfortunate. Now we're running out of time. Zap as many as you can. And there goes the whistle. Looking at the scoreboard, I see that Petra Brigden has triumphed. When I read my stars this morning, it said nothing about meeting a dark and handsome stranger. And then, lo and behold, who should arrive but Russell Grant, the TV Times astrologer. Now, Russell, before we talk about astrology or great love, we're going to talk about something called biorhythms, another way of making decisions about the future. Now, we're going to see how you were feeling on Christmas Eve last year. So we've entered your date of birth, that's the 5th of February, 1951, and the forecast date, the 24th of the 12th, 1982. Now, this is how you were feeling. All right, an important day, I'll add, by the way. So we'll see. Now, the first line on the graph we see is your physical feelings and on the 24th you were feeling pretty good emotionally not so good mm -hmm. mentally pretty disastrous now is that fair not really the physical thing yes i needed a lot of sort of physical uh, energy and vitality because it was actually the day i agreed to sign up with bbc for breakfast time so the other two the mental and the emotional are absolutely dead wrong i mean mentally i was way up very very together in my head and emotionally too i had so much gin i fell over three times <laughs> so i mean emotionally i must have been feeling really good yes. so forget biorhythms as far as you're concerned in astrology well, yeah, well, not astrology, but definitely biorhythms. Now, the thing is, can a computer be of any help to people like me who don't know anything about astrology? People can sell you programmes, can't they, which claim to tell the future? Well, they can, um, but the thing is, you need an astrologer to put the programme together. It's like you need a, a good person into biorhythms to do it. I mean, one cannot say with a sweeping statement, all biorhythms are bad because that one doesn't work for me. And uh, I myself was offered nearly £30,000, to put my name on top of a, a whole package that, in fact, they wouldn't let me program. They just wanted my name. So I, I turned it down, simply because you need to have the expertise behind these things. So a computer's not all that much use, <coughs> as astrology goes? Well, it is, but on the technical side for putting the chart together mathematically, but a computer is only as good, surely, as what you put into it. OK, Russell, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> And now, Stephen Brigden and Paul Hodson are going to flex their muscles and try one of the events in a great piece of software, Olympic Decathlon. Now, I tried the long jump earlier and fell flat on my face. Ouch! But let's see how the two lads get on with the hurdles. 
Now, to play this game, you have to press two buttons, one after the other, like this, quickly as you can. That makes the hurdler run. Press them both together, and he takes off. There we go. A successful leap. Now, you know, the object of the game is obviously to get down the course as quickly as possible. If you knock a hurdle over twice, you're disqualified. If you clip one, the computer automatically slows you down. So, I'm about to sound the whistle. Up to your marks. Get set. Go. Here's Stephen waiting for the gun. Now, at the top of your screen, you can see Paul Hodson's hurdler. At the bottom, Stephen Brigden's. Paul made a rather painful landing there over the first hurdle. Meanwhile, Stephen, passing the 20 metre mark. I should point out that the chipping doctor will examine both our contestants for the use of anabolic steroids and illegal stimulants. Paul soaring beautifully over the 40 metre mark. Although he seems to be mixing a bit of Hopalong Cassidy in with the Rudolf Nuraev. Stephen soaring beautifully over the 60 metres. It's a rather nice piece of graphics, actually, this game. Stephen seems to be out in front. He's passing the 90 metre mark. Beautifully over that. F oh, but he's clipped with a nasty bruised ankle there, I think. But he's coming up to the finish. Stephen is soaring joyfully over the finish mark with a time of 18.6. I can confidently predict that he's the winner. Now, I wasn't betting on the outcome of that race because I'm not a gambling man. Never since uh, I tried the see-through Yashmak company. But I might be tempted if I thought the computer could help me out. Problem. To turn one pound into lots. Solution? Cane the bookies. So what the sporting life's got to offer. Perth. 245. This looks handy. See if I can pick the winner here. Cape Felix, Even Melody, Press Gang, Saucy Moon, Chewing Gum Lad. Hmm, usually sticks well to the rails. Let's use this expensive hardware. Haha, -ha. run. Okay, Ted, feed me facts. Right, facts you want, facts you'll get. The 245 at Perth. Yes, that's not much help. You need more facts, all right? Let's see what the Sporting Chronicle's got to say. Uh, Chrome mag. Now you're talking handy stuff, hey? Right then, we'll have w Willie Carson. Carries eight stone overweight. That can't be right. Ron Joe's dream. Five bob each way, up and down, inside out on Willie Carson. Lyndon Mill. William the first. Chewing gum lad. Ran very well last time out. This is the stuff. Started off at 20 to 1, came in half past 4. Well, I've been through the sporting handicap, everything. The sporting chronicle, the sporting life, that's every fact I could possibly put into this. We're not getting anywhere, Ted. I need hot tips from the horse's mouth. Oh. The owner told Clarence the clocker. The clocker told Jockey McGee. The jockey, of course, passed it on to the horse. And the horse told me. Here's one. Hello, boy. Now, listen, you. Have you got any tips? Yeah, plant your geraniums early. All right, now, listen. This is going on you. And I don't want any messing about. All right, lad? OK. Take that and we'll say no more about it. Just you and me. Come on, Lizzie. There's a good girl. Now. Have I got all the facts right? Have I got all the information in the right order of importance to put into the computer? I mean, how many legs has it got? Yes, seems the right number. What did it have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? Well, it all seems to count, so back to the computer. Right, I've been to those stables. I've got all the information straight from the horse's mouth. Mind you, some of those horses are terrible liars. Now, feed it all into the computer. Ah, there we are. I've got all the weights, the right running times, what I had for breakfast, what colours the jockey's wearing, everything. Can't be wrong. Now the big moments. I press the button and the computer's going to give me the winner. <laughs> Barbados, here we come. 
Naughty Norman. I never thought of that. Mind you, 33 to 1. I put all my money on that. 50 pence each way. Seventh horse in the seventh race, and it came seventh. <laughs> I know, I could try roulette. That's numbers, isn't it? Or I could go greyhound racing. Mind you, I'd never beat them. Or go to Monte Carlo. From horses, we turn to football. Not computer football like this, but the real thing. And to continue this investigation into the help a computer can give a betting man, I'm joined now by Frank George, Professor of Cybernetics at Brunel University, which makes him an expert on all forms of forecasting. And lately, he's turned his attentions to football, the pools, and to betting on the horses. Now, Professor Frank George, an eminent Professor of Cybernetics, how did you become involved in forecasting the pools and doing the horses with the computer? Well, with the computer, it's very recent, of course. My interest in the pools goes back to childhood, in the days when you used to have to fill in a piece of the newspaper. You struck out the team that was supposed to lose the game, cut it out of the newspaper and sent it off, long before coupons. But much more recently, having done a lot of forecasting in my capacity of advisor to NATO and government to some extent, my family, I have two daughters, grown-up daughters, said to me one day, you're so clever, why don't you win money on the football pools? So I said, sure, why not? So I set out to do it and found it very much more difficult than I expected, and then decided to try and apply mathematical methods, which were familiar to me, and then use the computer, at least for time-saving, if nothing else. So you wrote a programme, can it improve our chances of winning? Oh, very much. There's no doubt about, uh, whatever about that. If you filled up a, a, a coupon at random, the odds are 1,000 million to one against you. It's enough to depress you unutterably. But even if you eliminate ridiculous forecasts, like having all the first eight matches of the 55 uh, score draws, you can reduce it by, well, a, a fairly considerable factor. And then by using a bit of nous and, and having 10 goes or 100 goes, not just one go, you can probably bring it down to about a million to one against. But even that's grim, because if you think of a million golf balls and a great big swimming bath, and you're asked to pick just one, and it's got to be the right one, you wouldn't be very keen about it if much depended on it. But what does a computer and a well-written program do that the average punter can't? It's systematic in a way that uh, people are not. It isn't the computer itself, it's the program, of course. What I did was study results for five or six years, build up relationships which showed that a team high up the league, which had just lost at home, might not do so well next week away against a team which is quite a bit lower down. Certain relationships like that do exist. It isn't a matter of pure chance, although there's a big chance element in it. It's that built into the program, experience over many years, which makes the computer effective. Not just the computer, but the computer properly programmed. Well, I know you're not a betting man yourself, but how have your associates gone on? Very well on the whole. Of course, there's a slightly depressing point. that They're not always terribly encouraged to find they do far better than any of the other professional punters, but still don't win. Moving on from football pools um, into a wider area of your interests, there seems to be a computer in many homes now, possibly one day a computer in every home. Is that a, an attractive vision of the future, do you think? Well, that depends whose vision it is. It's not an attractive vision for me at all. I find that rather depressing. It depends how you use the computer. If you use it for uh, games and things like that, I suppose it's a harmless. Uh, uh, not very intellectually demanding, one could hardly say that. But on the whole, the thought of doing that it seems to be rather typical of the rather dull, mechanistic age we're getting into. I think you might be better off going into the fields reading a book. I think you may be right. Professor George, thanks very much indeed. Pleasure. Well, with me now is Jane Bird, our resident expert, and she's going to chance her arm and tell us something about the future of the home computer. So, Jane, what's the future? Well, in the long term, lots more power, lots more memory, so computers will be able to see and hear just like you and I. Well, that sounds like science fiction to me. What's going to be the more practical future for the home computer? Well, the first thing is that machines are going to get much more accessible to ordinary people. Little old ladies, little old men will be able to do something useful with the machines. Like what? 
Well, they'll be able to access lots of information. They'll be able to do their shopping. If they fancy a trip to the cinema, they'll be able to book it. They'll be able to book their holidays as well. So really, the computer's going to become a source of information for each and every one of us. And communication with the outside world and with people in remote districts and remote areas. Thanks very much. Well, from one dream to another, though this one is really a bit of a nightmare. Norman Hodson and Dave Brigden are about to play Choplifter. Choplifter puts you at the controls of a powerful helicopter gunship. Your mission, to rescue the hostages held by the enemy. Stay on the ground too long and the tanks will pick you off. Though you can always try and pick the tanks off first, like that, before touching down. Here come the hostages. Now you fly the helicopter, much as you might fly any normal helicopter, with a joystick. One button turns it around, the other one fires your cannon. So, the winner will be whoever gets the most hostages back to base in one minute from... Now. Here's Dave Briggs. Norman Hodson, hurtling towards the hostages, touching down. The tank's menacing him, he's lifting off. Unfortunately, he's forced to abandon a few of them. Good heavens, I bet they're cursing. Norman, tactically, he's playing this rather cannily. He's gone back to base already and unloaded two hostages, who wave goodbye and re-enter the base. Dave Brigden using the flying backwards technique, which didn't pay off, he didn't see the tank. Now you've got 30 seconds left, guys. Dave Brigden takes off on the second sortie. He's still flying backwards. I think the breathalyzer is in order here at the end of this game. Meanwhile, Norman Hodson has bitten the dust. Now we're running out of time. Those desperate hostages, I think we're going to have to abandon them in only a few seconds. The whistle's about to go. And as Norman Hodson ends in a ball of flame, I can safely say that he is the winner, having got two hostages back to base. And so to the last presentation of the series. Once again, two families, the Brigdens and the Hodsons, have come into our studio and done friendly battle on the computer games. And once again, we don't bother to add up who's won and who's lost. And so I'm about to present these fabulous chipping trophies to Paul on behalf of the Hodson family and to Stephen on behalf of the Brigden family. Well done. And now it's competition time once again. This week we'd like you to send us programmes stored on floppy disk or cassette with the theme of a computer use around the home. Can you write a helpful programme like the gardening programme or the recipe guide? If you can, why not enter? And don't forget, it's still not too late to enter the earlier competitions. They were A. Devising an original computer game B. Educational software or a game for the very young C. A community use for the home computer D. A 10 second moving graphics sequence And this week's competition, devising a computer programme to help around the home. For rules and entry form, write to us, enclosing a stamped addressed envelope to Chip in Competition, Granada Television, Derby House, Liverpool L23UZ. That's Chip in Competition, Granada Television, Derby House, Liverpool L23UZ. Now, you better get a move on if you want to enter, because we've already had lots of letters asking for entry forms. From Mark Heap of Oldham, who's only nine. From Edward Jones of Flandudno, slightly older, 34. And from Michael Mills of Oldham, who writes, I am very attached to watching Chip In and the basic language used. Well, we also use lots of other language. We don't want to see any of that in your computer programs. Well, that's all from Chip In for now, because it's the last of the present series. I hope you've had fun. We certainly have. Goodbye. <laughs>